everyone. Welcome to the newest episode of On That Notes with Parker Whirling. Today's guest is an indie pop singer-songwriter, producer, and multi-instrumentalist based out of Brooklyn, New York. Her debut album, Cherry, is out right now on all streaming platforms, and you need to go check it out. Before we get the episode started, please make sure to like and subscribe to this podcast on Spotify, YouTube, and Apple Podcasts. And don't forget to follow us at on that note underscore podcast and follow me at Parker Whirling. And on that note, please welcome Anna Fox Rajinsky. I'm sitting here with Anna Fox Rajinsky, indie pop singer, songwriter, and multi instrumentalist producer based out of Brooklyn, New York, also a member of the psych rock outfit Quilt. Thank you for joining me for an episode of On That Note. The new album, your debut album, actually, Cherry, is uh, it's such a bop, such a great pop album. Uh, I'd love to ask you about, you know, the writing and the recording process of this and how it feels to have your first solo project out after being in, you know, a band for over 10 years. How does it feel? Um, it, I mean, it feels really good. It's it, it, There's things that I'm getting used to, like... You don't have bandmates to absorb every little experience, good or bad, along the way. Um, you're like your own echo chamber sounding board for every tiny detail. And um, it's really amazing. And also like a learning process too. Um, yeah, it's like, it's every little experience is a little bit different because you you just develop like, certain trust in your own instincts mm. and um that was a big part of making the record was like you know this is all up to me and then it felt really good it felt like healthy and it was just extremely fun i would imagine that is both freeing and scary at the same time being the one that has to make all the decisions i mean you mm. did work uh with the members of Ava Luna on producing mm -hmm. it, but still it's different from, you know, 10 years of relationship with a band that you trust on creative decisions, and most of those are now on you, but at the same time you get to create whatever you want. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it was, it wasn't terribly challenging to, like, come up with songs and find ways to, like, make them what I wanted to, to be. I mean, there was a lot of ener pent up energy there that really needed to just come out. And it, you know, once I got in the groove of like, once I kind of, uh, I don't know if I would say committed, but once I like really got in the zone with the kind of songs I realized I wanted to be making, it was very easy and very fun and just started flowing. Like I had a bunch, I wrote a bunch of stuff that like got shelved because it just was, not challenging for me and even listening to it I was just like mm, cool like it, it felt like the same old stuff that I kind of knew how to do and I, I I wasn't even excited while I was writing s some of these old songs and uh I had to crack out of it and like feel literally excited and happy and like rapturous while I was creating the stuff because that like that's the feeling I want to bring with me as I go along this new journey. <laughs> like, just literally feeling uplifted and, you know, like, it's fun music and it, it helps me out. <laughs> yeah. When it comes to writing, only you know when something is, like, really, really exciting to you. Because sometimes you can write stuff like the things you shelved. Maybe other people would really like those songs but if it's not doing it for you like to a totally different degree uh it, it won't make you as happy which really at the end of the day is what you're trying to do you don't want to write for other people was there a moment when writing this new album where you felt like okay now i i really see the bigger picture here and like i know exactly what i'm going for now because sometimes things don't always start like you know exactly what's going on and it takes mm -hmm. a while of figuring things out here and there with certain songs to like really see where what direction you're going in yeah that's a good question 
Um, yeah, I think like that moment for me was probably, well, there were a lot of moments like that, but there was a big moment when um, several months after Carlos Julian and I had, had worked on like a, a batch of songs um, that w could have been a whole album. Uh, a couple months later, I, I had this song written called Party Lines and I was like, it got written so fast and I just sat there and like, sorry, there's a train outside. Can you hear it? A little bit. Is that bit, coming through? That's okay. okay. I just wanted to make sure it's not going to be one of those like super Brooklyn interviews where there's a million noises outside that's the funny. window. That's funny. I did interview a band called Super Taste and one of them was like, his, the train was literally like outside of his window and every like two minutes you could hear it coming in and out. But <laughs> honestly, it's like, what can you do? We're, we're immersed in Brooklyn right now. It's it adds a little urban ambiance. Yes, um, exactly. <laughs> um, no, okay. So whatever. So I so I had this song written called Party Lines, and it it just spilled out, and like it was so effortless. I actually don't even really remember writing it. Um, it's it was one of those moments, and you know we quote unquote had this record basically close to done. But I thought you know what I I have a lot more to to do. And I like, I'm excited about the feeling of this song and the lyrical content um, feels more like fresh and in the moment for where I was in, as opposed to like other songs that were sort of breakup oriented and like in the past party lines. Um, and then subsequently the song Cherry were putting me back in like my present life and feeling musically really exciting and fresh for me. And they were just like, coming out of me and I was very excited to record those two um months after the rest because it it made the record like not just a time capsule of like one mm. painful time it was like here's an entire like year and a half of like almost two years of stuff that I went through and here's like a musical progression that I feel that I went through and so the record's very special to me because it it captures like all these different it captures an actual growth instead of just like being a sad, one sad diary like one <laughs> yeah. time, you know. Like a full circle moment or like you mm -hmm. actually have bookends on it that are like, this is how it started. This is how it's going. Um, yeah, totally. I, I read on uh, an interview you did with The Key, uh, a Philly uh, mm -hmm. online blog, music blog, that you said the, the lyrics for this new LP were more direct less uh surrealistic compared to your releases like with quilt so um was that something you were very uh like intentional about like did you know exactly what you wanted to say or did you feel like in writing the lyrics you were kind of discovering how you felt hmm that's a that's a really good question probably both um but I do think that like, I do, th okay, so like the, probably the oldest song on the record is, I think the first one was probably um, Going to See Them. It's on side A. And I think some of that, that song has like evocative imagery and like vague, vague like words that can be applied in poetic ways. Like, uh, you know, yellow car headed southbound and, it wasn't, that song isn't like, that song feels like a bridge between, you know, my previous material and this record. And as soon as we started getting into, um, yeah, like songs like No One Love and Party Lines and High Board, it, I was kind of just in this like no nonsense place and, and with a lot of things <laughs> and a lot of people and myself and like, choices that I had to just really buckle up and make and uh it definitely was coming out in the lyrics and I was like I don't care anymore about like kind of tossing these like flexing the English language in a certain way that that was useful for me at one point in my life like you know I mean some of the some of the quote lyrics I look back on and I think they're absolutely beautiful and and some I look back and I'm like dude like, what's I talking about like it was kind of just a, a way to I don't know I mean I loved poetry growing up and I was reading a lot of stuff at the time I was writing quote lyrics that really really seeped in and I, it's all cool um 
but a lot of it was sort of like, well, some of it was like, maybe I was hiding a little and it was sort of a, uh, like a linguistic veil that I needed to like, not really, it just feels better for me now to like, be a little bit more colloquial with the lyrics. It really, really feels a lot better. And there's a balance. Like, there's a. it's fun to have a really direct idea of what the song is really about and have it be really personal, and then you can have fun with language, like, here and there in it. And, yeah, that feels good to me right now. It is cool to really be able to document how you're feeling about certain things in a moment. I, in my own way, have had songs that I've written in the past where I still love the lyrics that I wrote, but I know that I'm not exactly talking about something that's specific to maybe what I'm going through. And mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but for me personally, when I'm writing, like something really big, I guess, could happen in my life right now, but I can't write about it in a way that I really enjoy until usually like months later because even if I try like I really try because I want to write it down I want to get it out but it doesn't really come out the way that I want it to because it's almost like you need that space or that perspective and time to really do it justice yeah I think uh I I know how that feels and what's weird now is I've been trying to like write things jot things down like while I'm in the thick of feeling them and even if it's just a couple words or an idea or a phrase um I'm trying to I'm trying this out I even have a song that I've been like that's ready to become a real song that at this moment is just lyrics and I never do this ever wow, yeah I don't even know like if I ever have and it's going to be challenging to like work around the lyrics and they'll obviously change, but like, yeah, I mean, that's just how I felt at that, on that day. I was like, I have, here's a little poem and I'm gonna put it into a form and like, let's make a song out of this. And it's, it's gonna be challenging, but I'm excited. Um, you know, cause have I was you... just feeling it in the, that day. I was like, I got, I have this big feeling and I need to put it down. You honor that. You honor that feeling and keep going. Have you done any of the music for that yet? No, not yet. It's kind of just like, it's just like living as words right now. And I haven't looked at it in a couple months. I need it to like cook, like marinate a little more. Yeah, totally. I'll, I'll take I'm really interested how that turns out because I've also tried to do things like that and just never follow through. It just doesn't feel... It doesn't feel, uh, it's like writing with your left hand versus your right or your non-dominant hand because I'm like, that just doesn't make sense to me. Although I know people who do that and it's pretty insane. I'm like, good for you because that is really cool that you can be so intentional with your words. But like, I have to have music to know what I'm going to write about. Yeah, I mean, in fact, it's a pet peeve of mine to like, I can hear a song and if the lyrics are kind of like, they're kind of trying too hard and they don't really fit well with the melody and the melody ends up suffering because you're trying too hard to like get this exact line in there. And I'm always like, Oh no, this person has done that again. Um, so I was really surprised when I found myself doing it and I, yeah, it's just going to be an exercise, you know, it's going to be cool. <laughs> well, I'm excited to hear that eventually. Uh, I do love the, the Cherry music video and Everybody's Down. The colors oh. in those videos are crazy. It looked so fun to film. I love... Thanks. What was the location for the Cherry music video? Arizona. Okay, yeah, it definitely looks good desert vibes for sure. Ca yeah, Cave Creek, Arizona. It's like uh, about an hour outside Phoenix. Okay. Um yeah, it was the first plane I'd been on uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. And um, it was, like, freaky getting there. And it was freaky, like, coming out of isolation in the city yeah. and going what? to, like, this other zone. How cool. long ago did you do that? So we filmed it, like, the first week of January. Oh, okay. Um, like, actually, right when the Capitol riots were happening. Um there's like a the part in the video when I'm like walking through the cafeteria in the red shirt. It's like a really yeah. long shot. And I'm like wandering through this cafeteria. That was like 
I can't remember. It was either right after or right before uh, I like found out about what was happening. It was that same day. Whoa. Um, yeah. That's wild. <laughs> I was just like, oh damn. <laughs> Okay, I guess we gotta like keep working, but yeah, fuck. like but like in between takes, checking your phone, be like, I can't believe yeah. this is happening right now. No, for sure, sure, definitely, like actually, yes. Uh, that was that day. It was fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> that is fucked up, but kind of that's kind of that you'll never forget where you were. Although I don't think anybody will forget where they were when they saw that. But that's wild that right. it was literally while you're doing the music video. <laughs> yeah, do you remember but... uh, the seed of this music video, like where that idea came from? Hmm. It was a lot of, for lack of a better term, mood boarding. It was mm. just my friend Alex, the director, and I were, we were like sharing Im imagery. Like I had all these saved images that I loved and I'd always wanted to kind of like, I don't know, like springboard off of them. And it started very visually. And also we spoke a lot about Robert Altman. Um, we spoke about... We spoke about like old school sci-fi movies, but that don't really incorporate like literal sci-fi elements, kind of like the feeling of a sci-fi movie. Um, okay. Yeah, like Tark you know, Tarkovsky. And I think we spoke of Close Encounters of the Third Kind, I think, like which led to me discovering like this font that I use for everything now and is used <laughs> in all the videos. Um, yeah, it, it was really like a... Oh, and the movie Safe, 1995 film um, called Safe. That was okay. a, a big inspiration, too, for the video. Um, gotcha. Also takes place in a desert. Yeah. Yeah. So we had like, like a fun little time planning it. And then, of course, like once you really start working on it, um, things change and morph and you improvise some things. And But it, but it was pretty planned out. And there, it was like, okay, there's three different outfits um, there's like this bespoke robe and there's these locations and the editing was like, was the part where a lot of things kind of changed, but I oh, love really? how it came out. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what always happens. <laughs> like, yeah, at least you, that's you what I found. You have one idea and like, you just have to run with things when things change because you never know what's going to happen on set or in the editing phase and you got to make up for something or you have additional stuff and then you want to throw some new things in there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, we were, I remember, I think we were FaceTiming really late at night, like one or two days before the video premiere being like, okay, we have it like... I was like, with it, please, like, put the labyrinth stuff in. We need to use it. It's so cool. Like, that almost didn't make it in, and I'm so glad that it did. But, oh, like the yeah. the last shot with the crazy circle labyrinth. The drone, the yeah. Yeah, like, that was wild. <laughs> almost didn't make it in the video, and I'm really glad that it did because that's it's sick looking. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Uh, speaking of kind of like you said improv earlier, improvisation regarding like the music video and kind of going with the flow when you need to but also having a little bit of a you know obviously an idea of what you're going for uh, I read that for you know when you performed with Quilt uh, back in the day that you were really doing a lot of musical improvisation uh, when you were playing live so do you feel like that had any influence over the new album do you still work with improving when you're doing music now or is that more of something that you've you've kind of put to the side at the moment i would say that since i'm mostly working alone it's not quite the same um when you're we would i mean the way we wrote was like largely improvisational like we would kind of just be in a room and uh, start, you know, the way a lot of bands work, actually. You just throw ideas around and, like, start making stuff up on the spot. You start singing funny melodies and lyrics on the spot and, like, car carve it out together. And um, uh, since I'm writing mostly by myself, it's not quite, like, the same, but I will say, like, mm, the melodies often are me just going over the tracks I've come up with and getting in a in a space and and yeah improvising stuff and doing it over and over and over until something clicks um but sometimes I'm pulling material from voice memos and whatever else so I don't know if it's like as free form as 
um, the writing and quilt was. It's more like me assembling things and then doing some improvisation like within that. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not as free flowy, but you have room to do so maybe with like the melody and the lyrics, but you construct like the canvas that it's supposed to be on maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I don't want to make music that is so meandering right now. I'm really, I feel very uh, awakened by like the part of me that is, that is organizational and like mm. really, like really intentional song structure. And like, I think almost every song in the world is too long, like straight the fuck <laughs> up. Like, yeah. like I, that's just where I'm at right now. This might change later, but I'm like, we got to get that chorus in at like, 45 seconds to a minute like y'all need to trim off like a good two to three minutes off the end of the sh you know like yes. put that verse try putting in the verse try only having one verse like see what happens there you know like i'm really into like effic efficiency in this mm -hmm. psycho way right now where i'm i'm like how much can you say in like the most appropriately in the most appropriate amount of time right so like sometimes that's really long sometimes you should just jam out for seven minutes because that makes the song better sometimes your song really only needs to be like two minutes and 35 seconds because that makes that song better it's song by song and I do think that's something that in quilt was like very very important to us was like which like what needs to benefit each song especially because it was multiple songwriters right so it was like okay what it here's like this person's little vision and what can I do to help um, this song knowing what this person like wants out of it. So for myself now, it's like each song, yeah, is like its own little world. And sometimes there really only needs to be like, sometimes it doesn't even need a bridge, you know? Like right. I also have a bone to pick with bridges um, Ooh. a lot of the time. <laughs> call them out, call out the bridges. <laughs> no, it's just like when I hear, there's some bridges that I hear that I think are, fabulous and there's some bridges i hear that just sound like they're there for the sake of having a, a right. bridge the person was like um, oh well this is where the bridge comes in so yeah and then it's just like this dumb chord change and they're just like here i am singing another key and it's like cool like i <laughs> i don't know like for instance um uh, okay so i've been <laughs> listening i've been trying to in an educational way listened to hansen's first record uh, nice. Recently. Wow. Didn't um, expect the Hanson reference. It's called Middle of Nowhere, and I think it came out in 97 or 98, and I'm really obsessed with this song, Where's the Love, on this record. Um, it's such a silly song. It's very, it's, you know, it's very fizzy. Uh, it has a nice message, but I can only listen to it up until the end of the first chorus. And I press stop every time because <laughs> to me, that is the song being like its complete self. Um, because I don't like the way they bring in a lower octave, like harmony in the second verse. I really don't like the bridge. And I think it just kind of like overdoes itself. And so I, I listen to it up until the end of the first chorus and I'm like, it's a great song. So this is really solid. Uh, <laughs> That's so you know? funny. <laughs> and I've been like playing it on piano. It's just a very satisfying chord progression, a very satisfying melody. And like, with all due respect to, you know, being 12 and making an album, like they kind of crushed it with that song. <laughs> yeah, that's true. They were young as hell doing that. So something to be said for that. Uh, that's yeah. what's cool, though, about that. I mean, being picky, like, you know, kind of being picky like that, knowing like, no, I'm not listening to the rest of that is you can apply that. To your own music like you know exactly when something is not working and you know when you're like making uh when you're going in the wrong direction you just cut it off quick you say we're not doing that we're going yeah. this way yeah sure it's like the marie kondo philosophy Ooh, for yeah, songwriting <laughs> making sure everything's like nice and organized and speaking of organized i also read in the key that you mentioned that um what are their names julian and Oh, Julian Fader and Carlos Hernandez. 
Yes, you said that they were very key in organizing your your thoughts or just the tracks. Yeah. Like, what was that? You know, go more into that. I'm very curious how that uh, collaboration was. Yeah, I mean, I had so much stuff. I had so much material. And um, I mean, in my actual like computer life of my files and my garage band things and like mm -hmm. my desktop it's very messy and uh i don't know like why but it just kind of always has been that way and i i had hard drives full of you know this and that and I, I had ideas of how these songs wanted to be but it was just good to like be in a studio with these guys and we're like here we are we're making a record like okay so here's my demo and there's all this other shit in it and i don't like what do you guys think and you know, sometimes they'd be like, cool, well, I don't really think you got to use this thing. And uh, how about you go in and try like a little synth part somewhere? And I'd be like, okay. And it was just good to have like, um, I don't know, people like on either side of me and sometimes very much in front of me sometimes, you know, it was, it was just a really good dynamic because a lot of my demos were like very flushed out and some of them weren't. So to have like, again, song by song, to have somebody there to, and they also are great musicians. So like Carlos played most of the bass on the record. Julian played a lot of the drums. They helped with a lot of like the drum programming. Um, yeah, it was just good to have some co-pilots to like keep me from overthinking everything, which I yeah. very much do. And to keep me, keep me on course and like hold me accountable for like finishing a project. You know, I, I very much still like crave collaboration in some way. And I think having co-producers is the perfect way for me right now to do that. Absolutely. Co-pilot is a great term for that because it does feel like you need someone to guide you in a certain direction like you know or be like almost like the bumpers in bowling you know you put those up mm, and they help mm -hmm. you like stay in your lane so that <laughs> it doesn't like go this crazy route because sometimes you can lose your head like trying to figure out what the right thing for a song is and having just someone else in the room whose opinion you respect just one can help you be like oh wait that's they don't even have to say anything they can just be in the room and you know, like, oh, God, that's not hitting right. And uh, But even if you don't do that, just having somebody else to either give you encouragement with things you already like so that you are feel, you feel confident in, or give you, you know, feedback saying, like, maybe that doesn't sound as good. Let's try something like this. And being open to that kind of collaboration really helps the songs more than anything, you know? And you, you do have to, like, give up that, that control almost, but uh, if it's with somebody you trust, it's really not a problem. Yeah, it's it's the best. I mean, especially when like I'm not a drummer. I'm not I'm not really a I'm not much of a bass player. Um, I can throw out an, a really specific idea, and those dudes are so good at like coming back with the perfect method. Um, that I could have never played myself because I literally like don't really excel at those instruments. So like in the song Cherry, for example, we we were trying to figure out a bass line in the studio. Um, a lot of the stuff in that song was like already ready to go when I brought in a demo, but one of the big missing parts was a bass line. And we finally, like Carlos was sitting there and he had the this like funny black and white um, headless short scale scale bass it's like wild thing and he was like oh wait put on this like ch put on this Chibo Mato song and we were all like oh yeah right exactly so we like listened to some Chibo Mato and then he just like busted out the perfect minimal bass line like like so few notes in it but so perfect and so not intruding on anything else but like keeping the groove perfect Right. And like the the actual beat of the song was me like texting Julian and a list of like four songs. And I was like, can you send me something that is like a combo of all of these beats and all of these songs? And he was just like, sure. And oh, did. And, it, and he crushed it. 
And then that beat, like, then I just sat on my floor and, like, cracked a beer and made my demo. A lot of which stayed, like, I think all the guitars stayed in the final recording. (laughs) Oh, that's cool. Um, Yeah. Yeah, just DI through my my interface. (laughs) Um, You know, it was... Just, it's just fun to think back on these processes. I'm just so excited to like work on new music right now and reminiscing about all these good times is like getting me all riled up. Yeah, you get jazzed <laughs> up again. And that's cool that all of them had different, you know, different worlds, different stories and different like approaches to each of them. But they do, it's such a cohesive record, truly. Thank you. So I do, I gotta ask, even though it's been like seven years, you did an NPR Tiny Desk concert. Mm, You're the mm-hmm. first first person I've had on this show who's done that. And that's such a like such ah! a cultural zeitgeist, I think, uh, for oh. our generation. So I gotta ask, like, how was that experience? What was like the ins and outs of how you got on there? How did you feel about it? Um, let's see. At the time, I guess I didn't quite realize like well, I don't think it had really popped off so much yet at that point. Mm. I feel like it was still, um, I don't know. It was like, whoa, it's NPR. Like, that was kind of the crazy thing. Um, oh, we're at the NPR, like, headquarters in D.C. Like, holy shit. And we saw, like, the news, like the newsroom. It was very, like, I don't know. It was kind of cool. Um, I don't remember how that happened. I feel, Bob Boylan was... Um, coming to our shows either before or after but he's such a he's such a like great like he's very supportive and he would almost always come to our shows in DC after that and it was it was awesome like he's really he's a good dude um and yeah it was it was kind of freaky like sitting there oh someone's calling me sorry uh it was a little freaky to to sit in front of because there's people watching you when you right. do it. Like there's an audience, so like all the employees of NPR are sitting there, like politely, like clapping after every song. And um, they handed me an acoustic guitar that they just had there in the office that I'd never played, which was a very nice guitar. So I was like, thank God, because all of my acoustic guitars suck. And um, it was nice to play <laughs> such a nice guitar. You know, it was like it was just an acoustic session, and we'd done a lot of them, and it. it felt like something we'd done a million times. And um, again, like I didn't know quite at the time that it was like such a thing. And then over the years, it just started getting like more and more views. And I was like, oh shit, I guess this is like becoming a big, um, it's like a big internet moment for any band. So yeah. I'm very like happy and honored to, to have done it because it has become something very, very large, like legit actual A-list celebrities do it now. Right. And <laughs> I'm like, oh fuck, like, that's so crazy that I got to be in that space too. You know? Yeah, you guys were doing it before it was cool. I mean, I guess. <laughs> yeah, we made it cool. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, you did. <laughs> Ever since Quilt performed, that was it. But it is wild to think the people that have you know been on there like it really is like a cultural zeitgeist. Like I remember mm-hmm. it wasn't as big maybe when I started watching it like when I was a senior in high school and mm-hmm. now like anyone who's anybody is doing you know wants an npr tiny desk concert and like mac miller performing like days oh. before he died was like rest in peace yeah rest in peace that was such a yeah. huge moment for everyone i think and it's when just, he passed away well that and like that performance i remember everybody oh, sure. like falling in love with it and uh, yeah just such it's so cool that you got to be a part of that i think yeah it was very cool i mean there's a lot of like touchstones or at least before covid there were a lot of you know youtube touchstones in like a band's touring career like audio tree and kexp and the tiny desk and like you know different different like high visibility internet shows you can do um i feel like that's kind of a post mtv like a like a post trl kind of phenomenon right because like i don't know there's no more tv really there's no more mtv and and so the internet is like where the visibility happens so it's just like only natural that some of those programs would become the go-tos it's just the way media works it's cool i hope that i hope they get to like i hope that touring goes back to normal and people get to do that stuff again in those studios because it's really cool 
Speaking of touring, I saw today you posted that you have your first show since uh, mm-hmm. COVID life, September 3rd. Where, where mm-hmm. is that? You want to give it the plug? Sure. <laughs> yeah, it's September 3rd um, at the Broadway, which is a cool, small club in Brooklyn on Broadway. And yeah, that's going to be September 3rd in, I think it's technically Bushwick um, okay. with Scout Gillett and May Rio. And, um, you know, we'll see how, whether or not our friend Miss Delta uh, yeah, changes yeah. those plans. But as of now, it's happening and it's going to be great. Yeah. So if anybody's listening, go check it out for sure. Uh, that's going to take us over to the last five where I'll just ask you five questions and we'll be done. All right. Number one is in the studio or playing live. Which do you prefer? I've thought about this before, and I gotta be honest, I kind of prefer, if I had to choose, I prefer being in the studio. Mm. Um, Cause it's, it's the creative part. It's, it's where you're making everything. And it's like, no one's watching you and it's, the options are like limitless. I love performing too, but if I had to choose, I would <clears throat> make records for the rest of my life. I, I'm with you there. I totally agree. It's like, uh, it's like creating something out of nothing you could write your new favorite song today you could add something to a song that you didn't really care about that makes it now your new favorite that's like the possibilities are endless yes i agree question number two is what do you think is a perfect album front to back whoa hmm Off the top of my head, just like first thought, maybe because we were talking about Mac Miller, but off the top of my head, um, Sweetener by Ariana Grande. Oh, um, wow, okay. uh, I think is a a perfect album front to back. Um, Pharrell Williams had a lot of, uh, he had a big hand in that record, and and Max Martin did too, and those are like two of my favorite dudes. Yeah. And the record is so emotional because she was going through insane stuff, and... It's uh, it, very inspiring, actually, while I was writing Cherry. Um, there's lots of perfect records, but that's the first one I happen to think of. <laughs> I've, uh, I've never listened to that whole album. I've never listened to an entire Ariana Grande album. Actually, no, that's not true. Is What's the newest one called? That came, um, came posi- out a year or two ago. Positions? Yeah, I think I'd listen to that one, but uh, oh. I've never listened to all of Sweetener. So Sweetener's I really good. Yeah, is that did that come out like right after Mac Miller died? Like, is that was that mm, kind of a no? Part it of that? came out before. Um, Thank you. Next is the one that came out after his death. Um, oh, okay. This was like this was more of like the post um, concert bombing, and gotcha. Like, she was in the thick of it with Pete Davidson and and all of that. Um, right. It's just a it's just a really fun it's a really fun record. It's okay. like. Yeah, puts me in a good place when I listen to it. (laughs) I'll have to check it out after this. Uh, You kind of already mentioned it, but the question number three is who's your dream artist or producer to work with? Oh, yeah. If I I were working with Pharrell, I would Mm. just die. Um, Pharrell would be amazing. But also, like, you know, as as far as producers go, I would be very, very interested to um, see what would go down with, with us. (laughs) <laughs> of course it's all just a major fantasy but that would be very cool one of these um, days though you don't you know you never know oh my god well sup for all if you're watching call me <laughs> yeah come on hit a girl up let's go for hit a girl all. up <laughs> i uh there's one band that uh i thought of just because all the guitar lines and your songs are kind of like angular and just not not always like uh <laughs> you're good they're not always, um, what's the word, like, just, you, you have some interesting guitar lines that are a little out there. There's a band called Omni that I feel mm. like would be uh, kind of an interesting collaboration in that sense. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've I've heard, heard them. them. Oh, you have? I have. No, I have. Okay. They're really, they're awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're they are really, really good. Sick. I love the guitar playing in that band. Right? Yeah. It's very, very different. Like, I don't know a lot of bands that sound like that nowadays and the guitar in your album really reminded me of them thanks yeah i'll have to give them a closer listen i've i've heard a bit of them and was like immediately drawn to a lot of things about the sound but especially the guitar playing for sure 
They have a song called uh, Wire or The Wire. That uh, that was what really got me into them. I don't know if you've heard that one. But... I'd, yes, actually. That's the one I have on my, saved on my in my iTunes and my phone. There you go. Yeah, I listen to that song a lot. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Question Makes number sense. four is, uh, what's on your musical rotation right now? What's on my musical rotation right now? Do I have yeah. my phone on me? You can pull up the Spotify. Let me look here and see what I have. Um, so I have dog hair all over my phone. <laughs> um, um, okay, I mean, we have this song, Knock Knock by Sam Evian. Um, he just put out, he just announced his new record, and I think this was the first single off of it. it like, he just put it out, and it's amazing. Um, okay. Yeah, Sam Evian, like the water. I think that's like his stage name, but Knock Knock, great song, beautiful string arrangements, and it's just so groovy and extremely cool. Um, I've been listening to a song by Sade called Maureen, which is the last song from her record Promise. I like probably listen to this song like three or four times a week when I'm out in the city with my headphones on, and it's like the perfect, it's like the perfect walking around the city song. Gotcha. Um, what else? I've been listening to um, a song by Becca Mankari. It's called Bad Feeling. Um, she's based out of Nashville. And yeah, I've heard of her for sure. Yeah, it's a, that's a really good song. Um, I have so much random stuff on here. I feel like those have been kind of like the big, like, let's see. Yeah, those, those are kind of been like my most recent, uh, most recent ones. Oh, and this, this artist, Greenhouse. Um, they're based out of LA, Green Hyphen House. This whole record is called Music for Living Spaces, and it's stunning. It's it's mostly instrumental synth-based record, and it's so beautiful. And it like ha- it has this profoundly calming effect on me. Yeah. And I like to put it on when I'm in my house and like sort of just need to like chill. <laughs> Decompress a little bit. Exactly. It is the perfect record for that. So yeah. Sorry, awesome. A lot of new things for me to check out. I'll uh, definitely check out uh, Sam Evian, Becca Mankari. What's Music for Living Spaces? And what was the other one he said? Um, oh, it's it's a song by Sade, oh, Sade. called right, Maureen. Right. Maureen. Yeah, it's so good. Nice. Good stuff. <laughs> and the last question here is, what's your favorite decade of music? Oh, whoa. Favorite decade overall that's really hard question to answer Mm -hmm. that's so hard that might be a little almost impossible to say i i think hmm if it's too hard to pick a favorite you could pick like a least favorite that's gotta go (laughs) i I feel like that's harder actually that is harder i think uh i let's damn because anything i say is gonna like come back to bite me in the ass i think like i don't know i don't want to like hate on some because the thing is there's always something really good there's Mm -hmm. always something that's really good and i don't subscribe to i don't want to be that person that is like obsessed only with one time um i think a lot of like quilts material got like people were kind of boxing it into a very like retro place like a very late 60s early 70s place and I completely get it and like that's great and I actually was like listening to a ton of that stuff at the time um but but I I've kind of like grown a little tired of like listening to that kind of stuff right now and I would say like yeah maybe I maybe I tend to avoid music right now from that specific era only because I went so hard on it right. and I just don't feel sometimes I feel like I listened to almost all of it like I was getting so like crate digging like what's the most obscure psych rock record that I can like find it it was very fun but I'm having fun now doing that in other eras including eras I lived through too like you know like getting back into like some of the indie rock from like my high school like era um that I loved has been cool like Yola Tango and the Shins and Mm -hmm broadcast who i could have seen live but chose not to and i wish i had because i will never have that chance again um right i've never heard of broadcast actually really 
no. okay, you have homework to do. Yeah, um, I've got a lot check of out broadcast. To to. Okay. Check out broadcast for sure. Every single record they did. They also have perfect records to answer your previous question. Okay. Um, yes, amazing. The lead singer passed away, sadly, um, several years ago. And so that's why like, I regret not seeing right. them. But please, yeah, check out. I think you'd like it. It's really good. Yeah, I would love to uh, check out broadcast. It's cool to get people's like high school records too like check those out because that's such a you know that's such a moment in everyone's life what you're listening to in high school yes i i mean i listened to all sorts of stuff in high school but that was like i mean finding discovering broadcast was definitely a big moment for me Mm -hmm. back then yeah (laughs) so favorite decade can't avoid the question i don't know if i have an answer um I, okay, to, to answer your question, for the record, Cherry, I felt most inspired by, like, kind of mid-80s to mid-90s. Okay. That counts as a decade. That's it 10 does. years. It does, um, yeah. I would say that, like, yeah, a lot of the stuff that was exciting for me was um, in that span of time. Mm-hmm. I kind of hear some Madonna in there now that you say that. Mm-hmm. For sure. Like, literally, I was bringing in Madonna songs and being like... What do I like about this? Like, why right. is why is this song so good to me? And like, what can I, what can I learn from Miss Madonna? Well, there you go, eighty-five to ninety-five. Final answer. Um, maybe more like eighty-seven to ninety-nine. <laughs> like <laughs> okay. a little twelve-year span. <laughs> All right, that's that's fair. We'll give we'll give the extra two years on that. <laughs> thanks, thanks, appreciate <laughs> of it. Of course. <laughs> well, Anna Fox Rajinsky, thank you for joining me for an episode of On That Note. It's been a pleasure talking with you about your new album, Cherry, which everybody needs to go check out. And if you are in Bushwick, September second, check you out at uh, the Broadway. Right, the Broadway. September third. Although September second is my birthday, so if you're in Bushwick oh, on September second, um, come get a beer with me because it'll be my birthday. But if you're in Bushwick on September third, please come to my show. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, happy birthday. Thanks. And, uh, everybody, go check out the show September third. And yeah, thank you again for joining me. It's been uh, it's been awesome talking with you. You too. Thanks so much for having me. This was very cool. Of course. All right. I'll see you later. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Thank you again for joining me for another episode of On That Note with Parker Whirling. If you haven't yet, please make sure to like and subscribe on YouTube and Apple Podcasts, and you can even leave a comment down below to let me know who you're listening to. On that note, I'll see you guys next time.